in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. A book like no other, and a book that's going to answer this question for us. I think it's the most important question you can ask. The book of John is going to answer the question, who is Jesus? Now, it's interesting because that's a question Jesus himself asked the disciples. If you remember the occasion, Jesus asked the disciples, so who do people say that I am? And they gave some interesting responses. Some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say you're one of the prophets. And then Jesus kind of narrows the question down by saying to Peter, but who do you say that I am? And Peter responded that you're the Christ. Or or if you read other accounts, you you are the Son of God. Well, it's interesting because if you ask that question today, who's Jesus, you're going to get a much larger list of answers. There's some people going to say, well, he's a good teacher, he's a good man. Some people would call him rabbi. Some people would call him a prophet. But there's other people that, uh, that actually would say, well, Jesus is son of God, small g, or he's a, he's a little God. There's some people going to answer the question that Jesus was a created being. He's Michael the archangel. Some people are going to say Jesus is just one among many gods. There's some people that are going to say that Jesus was the brother of Satan or that we are the spirit children uh, of God in the same sense that Jesus is. And so they're going to give a varied uh, type of answer today. There's some people that are actually going to be offended by the, the, just the mention of the word Jesus. You bring up the word Jesus Christ and uh, they're, they're really going to be angry with you because of the, the claims of Jesus. And so that, that, that question, it's really much, much deeper in terms of answers today than maybe it was in the first century. But the book of John, like no other, is going to tell us who Jesus, who Jesus is. In fact, the first few verses of the book of John are going to tell us about the divinity of Jesus. The divinity of Jesus. They contain a full statement of who Jesus is. And I want you to notice carefully, John chapter 1, the first five verses. Now, we've had it read for us very dramatically. I'm not going to quite do it like she did, but I do want you to notice John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. This light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Wow, what what a great section of Scripture. It may be a, an unequaled portion of Scripture. In fact, there's one preacher who, who says, says this. His name's Alexander McLaren. He says this is a magnificent masterpiece. And he says of the first few verses of John that this is the most profound page in the New Testament because it explains the mystery in the person of Jesus Christ. I've got to stop and say, I can't argue with him. There may be no more profound page in your New Testament than this. For me, a, a a comparable one be, might be Colossians chapter 1. And we're going to read that actually a little bit later. But the, the most profound page in Scripture because it declares who Jesus really is. It's going to explain the mystery of Jesus. What a great passage. It's also probably one of the most in, misinterpreted passages of Scripture in the New Testament. Certainly the first verse is the most misinterpreted in the Gospel of John. And people do strange things with it. But what can we know about Jesus? Jesus. And in these five verses, we're going to learn three things about Jesus. That Jesus is the Word, that Jesus is the life, and that Jesus is the light. And so I want to take each one of those, and I want to kind of in turn look at each one of those and see what those things say about Jesus Christ. And so look at each of those because what those things say are significant. And so we we might start just with the Word. And I've got to say, when, when we get here to the Word, the Word is Jesus. And so in the beginning was the Word well, we've got to stop and say that that is Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And you might say, well, okay, if it's Jesus, why not just use the word Jesus? Say Jesus was in the beginning with God. Why the Word? John is doing something special here. He's writing to an audience that's, that this word, Word, would mean something. Now, first of all, the phrase reminds them of the very beginning, right? Remember Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he's stopping to say, now Jesus was there and he was that word. For a Jewish person, the the, the God created the world by the word of God. And so this is very significant. The the creation took place through God's speech. Uh, He created the world by his word. Also, a Jewish person would say God reveals himself by his word. His words reveal his inner character, his nature. In fact, the words of God reveal for us the mind of God. And so it's important when, uh, when John is writing that 
He says these, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That meant something to a, a Jewish audience. Now, you might stop and say, yeah, but it doesn't really say it's Jesus. And I've got to stop, and I've got to kind of leap forward just a little bit and take you down to verse 14, because John is going to tell us who he's talking about. We'll be there in a few weeks, but we need to set the stage here with John 1.14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son. In fact, the word there, the glory of the only Son, is the word monogonos, the only begotten Son. That same word is going to be used in John 3.16, God so loved the world that gave his only begotten Son. And so we've seen his glory, the glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so John describes for us who the word is. The word is Jesus. Jesus is the, the, the word of God. And so in this passage, he's going to make three statements. In fact, just in verse 1, in verse 1, he's going to make three statements about who Jesus is and what he's done for us. He's going to bring out three aspects of Jesus. And I want to stop and just kind of take those one by one, phrase by phrase, three phrases. And so we find this. First one speaks to his preexistence. In the beginning was the Word. Now, it's interesting, that word RK, it means beginning or the starting point. But the grammar here, the language actually says, in the beginning, Jesus already was, his preexistence. In the beginning was the Word and that starting point, the original beginning. It reflects Genesis chapter 1. But notice, the Word existed before the beginning. In fact, literally, this, this could be translated, when the beginning began, the Word was already there. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was there, and He was from the very beginning. And we find out that all, all creation takes place through Him. And so the Word was already there. The Word predates what we would call time. The Word predates creation. Not a created being, but part of the creation process. In the beginning was the Word. It's interesting, the other passage that I think soars to the same heights as John 1 is Colossians chapter 1. And Paul writes using very similar language. Talking about Jesus, he's the image of the invisible God. For by him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him, in him all things hold together. Same type of language. In the beginning was the Word. Uh, we can read as we go down through that everything came to being through him. Nothing was made that has been made without Jesus. And so it talks about his preexistence, that the Word predates creation. So what, just the first phrase, in the beginning was the Word. Great depth there. But it goes on and says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And I've got to stop and say, this actually speaks to Christ's coexistence. A very important phrase. In fact, it'd be a tragedy if the second phrase wasn't there, because it'd read this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And we'd be missing a link that this is really telling us about Jesus. Notice, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. There along, coexistence with God, a face-to-face -face relationship with God. And so we find out there's distinctiveness, that Jesus was there with God. It implies personality and coexistence. Somehow there's fellowship between this logos, this word, the word and God. Uh, we, we, we see here that they're the same but different. There's a face-to-face -face relationship going on. And so there's there's something distinctive, and yet there's something the same about them. In the beginning was the Word. He was there from the very beginning. And the Word was with God, this coexistence. And then we get the third phrase. And again, I've got to say, we'd be at a great loss without the third phrase. The third phrase, and the Word was God. If we just had the first two phrases, okay, it's Jesus. He's there alongside of him, but doesn't really tell us about the divinity of Christ. All of a sudden, in the beginning was the Word. He was there to, from be, to the beginning of time. And the Word was with God. There's coexistence there. There's face-to-face -face con contact. But now we get this, and the Word was God. And when, when we get to this phrase, the Word was God, probably the most misused by, can I say, well, just false teaching, uh, cult groups about who Jesus is. The Word was God. And there's some, some people that want to translate this. There's some groups that want to say that Jesus was a lesser God. Or they want to stop and say that that. Uh, a small g God, less, less than God. In fact, there, there's a version of the Bible called the New World Translation that translates this phrase, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. And I've got to stop and say, just a terrible translation. But to prove that, I, I've got to give you a Greek lesson, Greek grammar. And I'm sorry, I mean, you might say English grammar is bad enough, but Greek grammar. But let me point out, first of all, that the, the word there, that the phrase literally is, 
and God was the Word. But it's translated properly. And so I've got to give you this Greek lesson, and you're going to see the word theos up there. It's the word God. You're also going to see a word that looks like and without the D. That's the verb. That's the word was. And then we see ho, that's a definite article. It'd be like saying the word. And so we find this phrase, God was the word. And you say, well, that's not how the Bible translates. It says the word was God. And I've got to stop and say, no accurate translation. And I've got to give you, if you were learning Greek, this is lesson two. This isn't lesson 16. This isn't lesson 35. This is not year two. This is your second lesson. This is about verbs. First lesson's about nouns. Here's what a noun is. Second one's about verbs. And here's, it's called Cole's rule. The guy uh, named Cole um, describes it for us. Can you go back, please? I'm not done with that other slide. Uh, this, a definite predicate nominative has an article. Now, you see the little O up there? That's an article. And so we see ho logos. That's the word. A definite predicate nominative has an article when it follows a verb. Now, the word an is the verb. It's the word was. And so we expect that. It should have the article, right? Notice the next thing. It does not when it precedes the verb. The word theos comes before the verb, so should we find an article or not? The answer is no. It pre- if, if it follows, okay. Now, here's what it says. The, if we look at a sentence, ho logos, that's the subject of the sentence. The word, we got our verb, was God. And there's some people who's going to say, well, it doesn't have the article. It must be a God. It must be some God small g. And they'll translate it that way. And I've got to stop and say, can you go back to lesson two of your Greek grammar? It's translated accurately for us. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. And the word was God. It's God. In fact, Cole, the one that writes that word for us, he says this about those who want to suggest that uh, maybe we shouldn't have an article there. To say that the absolute absence of the article bespeaks of the non-absolute deity of the word is sheer folly. You can't do it. This passage says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. That's the only way you can translate it. In fact, a first semester Greek student knows it needs to be translated that way. So that's your Greek lesson for the day. Sorry if I bored you. But in case you don't believe me, I want to do something else. I want to give you a second argument. Okay? Say you want to translate small g. Say you want to leave out the article the. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. You want to to make it a, guess what you have to do in chapter 1? If you're going to be consistent, here's what you'd have to do. You'd have to say in verse 6, there was a man sent from a God. Or you'd have to say in verse 12, he gave them the right to become children of a God. Or you'd have to say in verse 13, who were born of a God. Or verse 18, no one has ever seen a God. You see, nobody wants to argue that. And so the people that want to change verse 1, they don't change these verses. And you've got to be consistent because Greek grammar says, this passage says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was... God. God. That's what the passage says. It tells us about the deity of Christ. But there's even something to me more amazing. You've heard me talk about chiastic structure. It's a mnemonic device, but also a way of writing that shows the importance. This verse is a chiastic structure. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you know when you find a chiastic structure, where's the most important point of emphasis? Right in the middle. What does this passage say about Jesus? He was with God and was God. I wish I could give you about four or five more arguments to say, but just take it at this. There's no other way to translate this. John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. It it speaks about his preexistence, about his coexistence, and his equality. And I've got to say, this corrects all kinds of false doctrine. There are some people who are going to say that Jesus was not God, or there are some people who are going to say Jesus was a created being, or Jesus was a God small g, and that we can become gods like, like, and you've heard that kind of teaching, right? I want to tell you, John chapter 1, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is God. But it's interesting, not only does it tell us this about, that's just verse 1, but it goes even deeper. Let me tell you about this Word. The Word not only is God, but the Word is life. In Him was life. And I've got to stop and say, you know, when I study a passage, there's something I really love. I love rare words, right? If a word's only found once in Scripture, I go, oh man, I love that word. And I've got to tell you this word, life, it's not one of them. In fact, not only is it not rare, it's used over and over and over again. Now, I've given you an assignment. I hope some of you have done this. I really wanted you to read through the Gospel of John and under, underline every time you saw the word believe or believes, or believed, or believing, or unbelief, right? And if you've done that, some of you have been coming back to me and saying, here's the answer. In the ESV, 
the English Standard Version, depends what version you use, but in the ESV, there are actually 97 occurrences of the word believe. Truth matters, there are 98 in Greek, but one of them you won't be able to find because it's in Greek. It's not in our English translation. But you could do the same thing. And by the way, next week, I'm going to give you a list and so you can check your work. But, uh, but you'll see that next week. I want you to wrestle with it one more time. You could do the same thing with the word life. In him was life. And we find out this word is actually used 63 times. And you could go through the same thing and find out Jesus is, is life. And as you go through this book, you're going to find out different words that are used. Most always, the word actually refers to eternal life. And here's what we find. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was God. All things came into being through Him. And so we could stop and say, we owe our existence, our very existence to Jesus. He's the one that created us. And so we should stop and say, thank you. We know you're the one that's created us. And we could, we could stop and realize that we owe our physical life to Jesus because He was part of that creative process. And we, we read in John chapter 1, verse 3, we, we read those words that, that all things were made through Him. Without Him, anything was made, uh, nothing's coming into being that hasn't been made through Him. And so we can say, we know our, our physical existence is due to Jesus. And so all life, whether short or long, it, we owe it to Jesus. We should be appreciative of that. We should show our gratitude because he is the one that created us. But John's going to stop and he's going to say, not only is he the one that th everything was created through him, not only do we owe our physical life to Jesus, but we also, we also realize he's the one who gives eternal life. And if you go through, you're going to find out that half of the times that life is used speak directly to eternal life. And so we're going to read these words, in him was life. And then through the rest of the book, John's going to come back and keep saying, Jesus is alive. The word was life. That's Jesus. Jesus is alive. And we're even going to see Jesus using those, those words of himself. And so, for example, we can get to, to chapter 6. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. And that's really interesting because he's just fed 5,000 people and they're asking, who are you? And he's going, I'm the bread of life. Or chapter 6 again, the words I have spoken to you are life. Or I love verse 10 of chapter 10. I've come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Or then we get the account of, of uh, John, John chapter 11 with uh, the resurrection of Lazarus. Whoever believes in me, though that he die, yet he shall live. Or Chapter 14, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Or again in chapter 14, because I live, you will also live. And so in this prologue, we get in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In him was life. And the rest of the book's going to say, can I show you who Jesus is? Jesus is not only the source of creation. He's not only one that we owe our physical life to, but there's life in no one else. Uh, we can read like the, 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 the book of Acts that says, in him we live and move and have our being, but not just our physical life. He's also the source of eternal life. We're going to find out there's no way to the Father except through Jesus, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so we realize Jesus is the one who comes to grant life. And I've got to stop and say, you ever, you ever wonder, okay, what is the purpose of life? What's the meaning of life? You ever feel like, okay, is it really even worth it? Have you ever stopped and said, you know, I just feel like there's nothing really to live for. Anybody? Well, true life is found in Jesus. He is the source of life. God's greatest and clearest communication of who he is is the word of life. And he speaks life through his son, Jesus. And what we learn here is not only that Jesus is the source of life, creation, and we owe our, our, our we, uh, gratitude to him for creation, but we also find out he, Jesus came to give life. Not just eternal life. And so we realize he wants to give us quantity of life. We can live forever because of Jesus. We also realize that Jesus came to give us quality of life. Jesus wants to give you real life now. Jesus came so you could have life and have life abundantly. You don't want to, want to know the purpose of life. You want to realize what you're created for. Do you want to have abundant life? Do you want to have fullness of life? Do you want to realize, okay, here's why I was created. Here is what I was created for. And you want to find the true meaning of life. That comes only in Jesus. And so if you want to realize what you're here for, it comes in Jesus because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the one that gives life abundantly. And so if you're struggling with those things, you need Jesus and say, Jesus, why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? Because Jesus is the source of life, not only in the future, but life now. Jesus is the life. Isn't that great news? That Jesus came to give us life and life to the fullest, and he speaks life only through his son, Jesus Christ, because the word, the word is life. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. In him 
was life. And it's a, a great description of who Jesus is. But he's not done yet. He uses another word. And again, I've got to stop and say, not a rare one. Another great exercise would be go through your Bible and just find all the places the word light is used. And in, in, in this, uh, this book of John, we're going to find out 24 times he's going to use the word light. So we find the prologue, in him was life, and he was the light of all men. And then through the rest of the book, Jesus is going to come back and say, oh yeah, by the way, that word, the one that was with God, the one that was God, in him was light. He was the light of all men. That's me. I'm the way, the truth, and the, the life, and I'm the light. We're going to read, the life was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And Jesus is going to use those very words to say these type of things. Uh, uh, he, he's going to say, I'm the light of the world, chapter 8. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me uh, will not walk in darkness. He'll have light of life. Or chapter 12, I've come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may, may not remain in darkness. It's interesting, but it's not just the book of John. It's also the books of John that he loves this word light. And so we've got the gospel of John, right? We also get first, second, third John. He loves the word light in those books. Also the book of Revelation. Notice first John. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So we realize that Jesus, in the beginning with God, was God, that he's the source of life, and he is the light to mankind. Now, I've got to stop and, and just say, um, does anybody just really like darkness? Anybody like total darkness? Darkness didn't used to scare me as much as it scares me now. I don't know, there's something, I'm not only getting more afraid of the dark, I'm also getting claustrophobic. And those two things together, those are a bad combination. I remember the days when I used to love to crawl through, you know, pipes and go into dark holes and places, and it was fun. And now I, I go under my house, I'm in my crawl space, and if something happens, I'm scared. It's like, get me out of here. And the tightness of that just comes in and closes in on me, right? Anybody else that, that way? Some, some, for some reason, I'd just a lot rather send my kids down to the, the, the crawl space <laughs> than, than, than me. And I don't know how that's changed, because I used to love doing those kind of things, but I don't like darkness. But not, not just the, the physical experience of darkness. You ever feel like darkness is just crowding in around you? You ever feel claustrophobic just in, in life? Most people don't like to be cramped into dark places, but also most people don't like to live constantly without seeing the sun. Is that true or not true? It's nice when the sun comes out, right? Where we see a light of the sun, having lived in Seattle, and we love Seattle, but there are times in Seattle where it doesn't, the sun doesn't shine. Did you know that? It rains in, in Seattle. And here's an interesting thing. Do you know the suicide rate in Seattle goes way up when the sun doesn't come out? We, we like a ray of the sun, don't we? You like the sun, the sun to come out. But I, I've got to say, sometimes life just in general feels that, that, that way. I'm not talking about the physical sun. I'm talking about the fact, the fact sometimes it's nice to have a ray of light inside. It's, it's, like, it's, it's great to have a glimpse of the true son, S-O-N. And here's what we learn. That's who Jesus is. And so anybody here that, that really feels like darkness is seizing you, anybody that feels like life is crushing in around you, is there anybody here that really feels like, well, you're claustrophobic? Jesus will come and help because Jesus is the light. Jesus is not only the creator of life and the one who will come and give us abundant life, we also realize he's the one that will bring meaning and purpose to life, but he helps us see in a dark world. Where with Jesus, we can avoid walking blindly. With Jesus, we realize that we, he can keep us from falling into sin. He helps us see in a dark world. And with Jesus, he's the light. Just think about Jesus. With Jesus, Jesus is one, the one that shows us what the Father looks like. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is the one that can, can overcome the darkness of evil. Jesus is the one that can displace our doubts and fears and troubles and give assurance. Anybody feel like life's just too hard? You don't know where to turn? Jesus is the source of life. In our despair, Jesus gives stability and provides us with an anchor of hope. In Jesus, even as we face death or sickness or disease, Jesus can provide the light of healing, the light of comfort, or the light of his purpose of eternal life. All right, isn't that great? That no matter what you're going through, who you are, what your trials are, and turmoils are, no matter what kind of darkness you experience, Jesus will shine forth the light of truth. He'll provide you with love and peace and joy in a very dark world. I've got to say amen to that. See, we need that. Jesus is, he's life, but he's also light. 
And so if you're going through hardship, you're going through trouble, you're going through turmoil, life is crushing in on you, and you're feeling like you're claustrophobic, just in life in general, you feel like this is a very dark place, Jesus is the ray of hope. You need someone to turn to? You need some light to your path? You wonder what direction you should go? That's Jesus. He is the light of the world. Jesus is the one you need to follow. And so this word, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He is the life, and in him is light. He leads people out of darkness. It's a great it's a great passage about who Jesus really is. And then what John's going to do, he's going to take those words like life and put those in the mouth of Jesus. He's going to say, I am the life. He's going to put those in the words of Jesus, I am the light of the world. You see, it's the very thing we, we need. And then we find this interesting phrase. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. It's a phrase I'd probably encourage you to underline in your Bible. And depending on what version you, you read, you're going to read, darkness not, not overcome it, or you're going to read verses, the darkness did not, not understand it, or the darkness could not comprehend it, or the darkness can never extinguish it. And it's translated various ways. In fact, it's kind of fun to just take out different versions and lay them down and say, I wonder how it translates that phrase. The reason is, the word actually has a couple meanings. And so you take this word in, in Greek, and it actually can mean to to overpower, over to overtake, or to seize. And so if we realize, okay, here used in the negative, the light comes in the dark, the darkness, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can't overpower, the darkness can't overtake it, the darkness can't seize it. And it can be translated that way, and it's great news, isn't it? That Jesus came to be a light of the world, and the darkness will not defeat it. The darkness cannot overcome it. The darkness can't seize it. In fact, here's the message. Jesus Christ has been victorious. And although we live in a dark world, and although sometimes it seems like darkness is conquering, and although sometimes we think, man, darkness is so prevalent, I've got to stop and remind you, Jesus is a light, and the darkness will not win. Jesus Christ is victorious. In fact, the battle's already been won. And again, we can say, amen to that, can't we? That Jesus has been victorious, and the darkness will never overcome it. It can't overpower Jesus. Jesus wins. But there's this other phrase. Well, it could mean to appreciate or to comprehend or understand. And here I've got to stop and say, translated negatively, it means the darkness can't appreciate it or the darkness can't comprehend it or the darkness can't understand it. And as I look around the world, you'll see people who are offended even by the name Jesus, right? You say name Jesus and they're offended. And it's just really strange to me. You've heard me talk about this before that if you don't believe in something, why is it a bother to you that I believe in it? Okay, you take the Easter bunny or, or you know, flying reindeer, or whatever you want to, if you don't believe in that, or the unicorn, well, you wouldn't go and write a book about, I don't believe in unicorns, or unicorns aren't great. But people do that about Jesus, and why is it? Because there's something about the name of Jesus that infuriates people. And here's what we, we find in this, well, Jesus came to the world of the light, and the, the darkness can't appreciate it, the darkness can't even comprehend it, the, the darkness just doesn't understand it. And I've got to stop and say, that's true, isn't it? Darkness does not see Jesus, and they don't recognize who Jesus is and what he's done, and darkness even hates Jesus because he's a light. And so it can be translated either way, and I've got to stop and say, okay, which one is it? And my answer is, yeah, it is. And you, you might think that's strange, but actually in English thought, we want to have it clear cut for us, but actually in Bible times, this is pretty common, to lay it out and say, okay, which one is it? And the answer is, yeah, both these things are seen as true. You see, the lightness comes into the world, and the darkness can't comprehend it. They don't understand it. They can't appreciate it. And realize, while they can't appreciate it or they don't understand it, they can't comprehend it, darkness never wins. It will not overpower the light. It can't overtake the light. It can't seize the light. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And the light that comes into the world, the darkness does not understand it. It can't comprehend it. It will not overcome it. I've got to stay, say, praise God for the word Jesus Christ, who is the life and the light of the world. Isn't that great news? And we're just in the prologue. We're just getting started. And we realize the darkness can't comprehend. The darkness can't overpower. Evil will not overcome light. Evil, darkness, will not extinguish God's light. In your life, things may seem bleak. Things may seem dark. In your life, there may be all kinds of problems. You may feel like you're being squished. You may be claustrophobic. Your darkness may come from your job or a, a relationship with somebody or a problem with your 
your kids, or a problem with your parents, or a problem with your neighbor, or a problem at work. Your problems may be health issues, or maybe even staring death in the face. Things oftentimes get dark. I want to stop and say, but Jesus came to shine light in a dark world. He came to give us life and give us life abundantly, not only better life now, but he also came to give us future life, eternal life. And when things get dark, you need to allow Christ to come in your world because Christ's love will come shining through. He's light. Anybody struggling? Anybody discouraged? Anybody in need of assistance? Anybody feel all alone and trapped? You feel disheartened? You feel discouraged? You need some light. You need Jesus. And I want, to hear, I want you to hear the masterpiece that oozes off the page of John chapter 1. Can you hear it just one more time? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. See, in Jesus, God became flesh. We have life, and we have light. In Christ, the love of God comes shining through into a dark world. In him was life, and he was the light of all men. Will you pray with me? Father, I want to come before you. What a magnificent verse. Telling us who Jesus is and what he came to do. Father, we realize that this, this one verse, really verse one, puts to, puts to bed all those false teachings about Jesus being a lesser God or Jesus being a God, small g, or, or a created being. We realize that, that Jesus emptied himself. He came to live like a man, to bring hope, to bring light, to bring life. And Father, it's, it's Jesus we want to worship. And so help us come to him and make him the center of our life, because that's who he is. And that's our prayer. And we pray this in the blessed name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus. Amen.